Right, thank you, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation. Thank you to all of you for staying the last talk of a long day. Um, I'll try not to make it too technical. Um, so this is joint work with um, a student, a former student now, Jia Cheng, who um, just graduated and is now working for Google. Um, Ji Zhu, a long-time collaborator of mine at University of Michigan, and um, one half of it is also joined with Pei Wang, who is at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. So let me start from a brief introduction to graphical models, um, just in case um, the non-statistical people are not quite familiar with the terminology. Um, there are different types of graphical models people talk about. I'm just going to focus on this one particular type of the graphical models that represent conditional independence relationships between a set of variables. So in the simple toy example here, um, in this toy graph, if there is no edge between, say, variables one and two, that means they are conditionally independent given three, four, and five, given everything else. Whereas, say, these two are dependent given one, three, and five. I'm not going to go into directional graphical models, so I'm not even going to attempt to infer anything causal, so this is just undirectional, just association. And typically, we don't know what this graph is, and we're trying to estimate it from n observations on p variables, and of course, p could be large and could also be large. And um, just to emphasize that from the beginning, this is not a prediction problem. Unlike regression, this is basically exploratory data analysis. We're just trying to see what relationships there are in the data, see what's going on, find interesting edges. So there's no prediction error that we can really use to evaluate this. Here is one well-studied example just to show you what kind of thing you can get out of doing it. Um, this is a data set on the US Senate. The variables here are senators, so there are 100 nodes. This is data from um, the 2005 to 2006 session, so two years, one Senate. So they're all the same senators, and they're the variables, the observations are the votes, and all of that is publicly available data, and you just see if they vote yes or no. Um, there's a lot of sort of extra little things you can do with it. I'm not going to go into this because that's not really what I'm talking about, but just to show you what kind of information you can get. So you find the edges. Um, the thickness here represents the strength of the association. That's kind of the proportional to the partial correlation between variables. So you can see what's associated strongly. Um, the colors represent positive and negative. So of course, um, well, they're colored in the conventional way. The blue ones are Democrats. The red ones are Republican. Um, there's also one purple independent in the middle of the Democrats, if you can see him, Jeffords, he votes with Democrats, which you can see from there. So the red links are negative associations, they're anti-correlated, of course. And you find things like you know, what we know without any graphical model anyway, that the, it's extremely partisan, but you also find other things that are not necessarily obvious, which is there are subgroups and you know, political scientists and people who watch a lot of C-SPAN, which uh, my collaborator and this happened to be, can really um, extract a lot of meaningful kind of information out of this thing that matches what they believe to be true about um, the Senate politics. So that's just an example of an exploratory data analysis using a graphical model. Um, so how do people fit these things? Primarily the, work, the statistical work um, has focused on two cases. One is Gaussian graphical models, um, and people like studying them because um, in Gaussian models, independence equals a zero correlation. So all you need to do to infer um, a Gaussian graphical model is estimate the precision matrix, which is the, um, just working this omega matrix, it's the inverse of the covariance matrix of the normal distribution, and there has been a lot of work on that. And then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the zeros of that matrix and the graph. So you can just read off the graph from the covariance matrix. 
before people worried about big data and large P, um, this problem has been looked at already. It goes at least back to Dempster in 1972, and people just develop hypothesis test type things for just thresholding, basically, and selecting large elements. Um, in 2006, um, Nick Kalimanshausen and Peter Bullman proposed um, neighborhood selection, a very intuitive idea of just regressing one variable and the rest and looking at the coefficients and doing last two, and then if the coefficients are non-zero, that means the two things are dependent, conditional, and everything else. Um, and then there has been an enormous amount of work on estimating precision matrices in various more likelihood type uh, ways. Um, with different penalties. This is perhaps the, the most studied one. This is now known as the graphical lasso. Um, there's the G lasso algorithm due to Friedman, Hasty, and Dipshrani. Um, and there are actually now newer, faster algorithms that can compute a sparse precision matrix on, say, a million variables fairly quickly. So this is entirely doable. And so that's, but that's all for Gaussian um, models. And there's a lot of work. And then the other case that people have looked at um, fairly extensively is the icing model, again, because you can write down things nicely. And there you have a likelihood. This is, in principle, you can make it work for discrete data, but we'll just focus on binary because it's simpler to write down. So saying you, all your variables are binary now, instead of all the variables being Gaussian, um, typically the likelihood people write down looks like this. You have main effects here, and then you have interaction terms. And the interaction terms tell you whether there is an edge or not. So if you zero out some of these coefficients, you get a graph. You can include higher order terms in principle, but typically people don't, because for the pairwise interaction, you just need second order terms. So this likelihood includes the normalizing constant which is intractable, so unlike the Gaussian, this is not easy to estimate directly, but people have found ways around it, of course, and various approximations to the likelihood have been used, such as surrogate likelihood and pseudo likelihood and various other ways. You can also do something very much like neighborhood selection, except because you now have binary data, you just run logistic regression instead of the straightforward lasso. But if you run penalized logistic regression, you can also learn the graph that way. Or you can penalize the likelihood and, or some version of it and, and maximize. So this is um, all the work that has been done. A lot of good algorithms have been developed, which at least some of them scale pretty reasonably. And um, here is the motivation for what I'm going to talk about, which is a very dependent graphical model. And this came from a particular data set that um, I will tell you more about later on. Generally, when people um, look at this, they just have IAD data, IAD p-variate vectors. But in practice, often you have other information that you may be ignoring for the graphical models, but ideally you should take it into account. And in this particular case, um, what, what our collaborator was interested in is a genetic network. So the variables on which they wanted to construct the graphical model were genes. Um, and this is a breast cancer study, so the data comes from patients who all have breast cancer. But then you, they also know things about these patients. So they're not IAD. They have different tumor stages. They have um, different mutation status of a particular gene, which is well known to be linked to breast cancer and, and other things. So what they wanted to know is, can we make this graphical model patient dependent, but not just patient dependent, but in an interpretable way? So we can find out what affects interactions between which genes and say advanced tumors cause these other genes to interact in different ways. So. Um, you can do this covariate dependent thing for 
any graphical model doesn't matter here just because of the application and the application of the data is binary I'll focus on the icing model but it doesn't really matter and what the, the goals that we have are the model that's interpretable and continues not really continues but in the following sense that if you have two patients that are similar to each other that they have similar covariates you want their graphical models to be similar right so you want some kind of continuity across the space even though of course the space is completely discrete because it's a graph but in some sense we want them to be similar and of course computationally feasible so um, this problem well, we are also not the first people to look at it. Um, it it has been looked at to some extent um, there are a couple of um, papers here where the mean, so this is a Gaussian distribution we're thinking of, the mean was modeled as a function of covariates and then you subtract it off, but then the precision matrix was not and then you still end up with the same graph for everyone and we really wanted different graphs. Um, then Liu et al um, looked at a very non-parametric approach to this where they just partition the covariate space suitably and then fit a different graphical model to each part which gives you a good fit but not necessarily interpretation because the partition is completely non-parametric and you can't really find out um, how it changes with different values of the covariates and um, a former student of mine um, also looked at fitting several related graphical models jointly across different categories which you could think of as conditioning on a single covariate which is categorical but that's of course very specialized and we want to be able to condition multiple different covariates but there has been some um, some work in this direction so what we did is it's fairly simple but it satisfied our um, goals is we just took the icing model and that in the standard in the standard case, there is no x here, but now we're modeling the parameters as the functions of covariates. And we parameterize them linearly because if we do it linearly, then we can easily interpret the coefficients. We have continuity. If we change one covariate a little bit, the model in principle changes just a little bit, and it's also convex. So computationally, that's very convenient. Um, we still can't maximize the likelihood, so we do the usual thing and look at conditional likelihood, one variable given the rest, which is basically like running a logistic regression, just on more things, and we use the L1 penalty to do selection, to select edges and covariates. Um, like in all of these icing models, you can, or actually in, in Gaussian models as well, you can do these separate regressions one at a time, so you regress one node and everything else. Um, then you end up with an asymmetric solution, so then you need to do some kind of post hoc symmetrization. It will usually take the minimum or the maximum. Or you can estimate everything jointly, um, combine all these regressions, and then, um, of course, you have a much larger parameter space over which to minimize this thing so the first approach is much faster computationally and so that's what we use and we use the sort of coordinate descent type algorithm which is a version of what um, if you're familiar with a GLM net package it's kind of Friedman hasty and Diptrani thing it's some version of that so it's it's reasonably fast it's not um, incredibly fast but it's, it's reasonable um, so just going back to the data example, just to show you what types of things you can get out of this, um, is um, just to give you a little bit more information, the variables are deletion events of tumor suppressor genes. So we believe that you know, if you delete a gene that suppresses a tumor, that has effects on cancer, and they want um, to know how it varies across patients. So there is 143. Um, data points, um, the old breast cancer patients before start of therapy, so the tumors are still present in whatever stage they develop to. Um, it starts out with about 40,000 DNA um, copy number profiles, which they combined into 620 citibands. To emphasize that this wasn't us doing this in order to reduce dimension, uh, it was done as part of the data collection for 
sort of internal reasons. It, it basically it increases the signal to noise ratio. Like they pool the data because then the, there's the signal is better. So what we um, end up with is 620 dimensional binary vector and then just three predictors, two of which um, are binary. Um, mutation status of a particular well-known breast cancer gene and estrogen receptor status, which is also something that's been shown to be connected to breast cancer, and then the tumor category, how advanced it is, which is an original variable. So it's a small set of predictors in this particular study. Could be bigger, but still we want to know how these things matter. So um, this is the this is too big to plot, right? In the Senate, you can just about make a picture and look at it here. You can't really make a picture. So what we look at is the strongest edges, and um, we did stability selection on this, which conveniently Richard has just explained in detail, so I don't have to go into this. I think it's very important to do something, some version of stability selection on any high-dimensional graphical model, because they're known to be unstable, and um, any one particular graph is probably you know, you can probably find another graph that um, has a similar value of the likelihood, but if you do stability selection and you see edges that come up over and over and over again, then at least those edges you can trust more so than the others, and that's what we focus on. So um, these are the variables, and primarily they care, they care about interactions that are on different chromosomes because things that are close together on the same chromosome are likely to interact anyway for uninteresting reasons. So those um, have been omitted, and you get the main effect, which is, means this edge is always there, but then we also get um, the other pairs that are affected by a particular predictor. And um, I'm not going to go into the biology of this and the explanation, but um, they were quite happy with this for, because it both sort of found certain associations that have already been known from other studies, experimentally conferred, and other new things that they haven't known before, but that sort of made sense from some kind of biological perspective, but I won't go into that. Um, so this is also an output of a graphical model, not as pretty, but um, you know, possibly, hopefully, um, somewhat useful, at least as a guide for the biologist as to what they should look at maybe and um, explore more. It has a high frequency. Uh, just very briefly mention um, the theoretical properties of this. Um, we focus on the separate approach here, which is what we do in practice anyway. Um, you just need, it's all fairly standard kind of penalized regression theory. We need standard assumptions on the design matrix, exponential decay on the tails of the predictors, um, and um, we get the usual kind of results on parameter estimation consistency. <laughs> wow. Okay. So this this is dead now. Okay. This one. Okay. Should, should I use this one then? Because this, this works, right? Okay, let's see how long this one was. And, and roughly speaking, the rate of convergence is governed by this thing, which looks quite familiar, I think, to those who have worked on this. Um, P is the number of variables, Q is the number of covariates, so this makes sense. And D is the largest number of non-zero parameters per edge, which is the right measure of sparsity for this. It, it matters not only how many non-zero edges you have altogether, but it matters even more how many non-zero parameters you allow yourself per edge. So uh, I don't want to go through this, but just in case you want to look at it, this is what the assumptions look like. It's kind of the standard irrepresentable condition type of stuff, and this is what the theorem looks like, so you got uniqueness and neural consistency and model selection consistency. I'm going to skip that. Um, but just a quick 
simulation, um, again, just to show that the number of non-zero parameters per edge really matters. So um, in this case, we, this works better as the pointer, let me just use that. So we vary the total number of edges present in the graph that goes across 10, 20, 30. And we also vary the proportion of non-zero coefficients. So that's this row here, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.8. And so you can see if you go across the rows, and this is joint versus separate, so those are quite close. If you go across the rows, nothing much happens, and it slowly does decay as, you, as it becomes less sparse, as you would expect. But um, as you change the proportion of non-zero parameters per edge, it actually affects it much more. So, so it's this kind of the maximum node degree idea which, which matters for this. Um, Okay, let me, so that's, that was for, so that was very dependent, yeah. This one? Oh, yeah, I think this one should be outside. Okay. I think so, actually. Yeah, I think that's the typo. Thank you. Yeah, because here there will be a... Yeah, I can't plug this in. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. Because that, that's where it usually would be. Right. Yeah. Okay, so for the, um, for the mixed... For the mixed graphical model, that was sort of another... Um, extension of the graphical model that we looked at, again motivated by um, uh, practice. Um, this is actually a question I've, um, I've gotten in talks multiple times, usually from some very applied people who had data that they wanted to analyze, and I used to work on a lot on this precision matrix estimation, so talked about that, and they would say, well, and I really like this and I want to do this and my data set has discrete variables and continuous variables, which a lot of data sets do, right? And then you can't actually do that, right? You can't do the Gaussian model and you can't do the icing model because they're mixed. And that just seemed very unsatisfactory somehow. It seemed like something that we should be able to handle. So we um, you know, went back and looked at the literature and checked whether anybody ever looked at that and of course people have. So suppose you're in a setting where you now have X that consists of two parts. Z is binary. Again, you can make it discrete in general, but it's easier to write stuff down for binary. So let's just say binary. And Y is continuous. There are Q binary variables, P um, continuous variables. And um, Lauritsen and Vermouth um, introduced something they call the conditional Gaussian distribution for jointly modeling things like that in the context of graphical models. And this is also in Lauritsen's graphical models book. Um, and this is what it looks like. So if you look at this carefully, then um, what you see is a Gaussian, right? So Y is the continuous part, so this is just the Gaussian density. But all the parameters depend on the binary vector. So that means that for every possible combination of the binary variables, there is a different Gaussian to fit. And so um, that's, of course, too many Gaussians if you have um, a lot of variables. Um, that's two to the Q different Gaussians. So that becomes infeasible very quickly. They, um, they also derived the the canonical representation, which is what you need to relate parameters to a graph. And in Gaussian case, it's very simple. Here, it's a little bit more complicated, but um, they derive this. Again, this, this looks very complicated, uh, but basically what it says is that, so these GZ, HZ, KZ, these are the parameters of the Gaussian, and what it's, and what it says is that you can write each one of them as a sum of these parameters over all the subsets of the graph. So 
So these are um, all the subsets of the indices of the um, discrete part, and then you write it that, in that way, and basically it tells you what has to be zero in order to know that there is no edge in the graph. Um, one, I'll, I won't go into the detail of this like, sort of more general formulation. Once we look at it in the more specific case, it will be more intuitive, hopefully. So that, that model um, has two to the q times p squared parameters. Um, so we, we can't really fit it um, at all unless we do something with it um, if q is large. And um, so what we did is um, truncated it, basically. And instead of looking at the sum over all possible subsets, so, so over all the clicks in the graph, we just look at truncated subsets here up to size 2, and in these terms up to size 1. Why these particular truncation, why 2 and 1? Well, that's because this is the smallest possible model that gives us all graphs. So this model still allows all possible interactions between binary variables and binary to Gaussian and within Gaussian. If we truncate it any further, then some edges will just be impossible to have. So now this has just um, the most q squared parameters in terms of q or p squared times q, whichever one is larger. Still not so small, but manageable. And it includes all possible graphs. And now we can, for this model, it's um, much easier to read off conditional independence Um, if you look at where the interactions are, you can basically see them, right? You can see where the two z's are multiplied together. So if there is no edge between two discrete variables, that's the parameter that needs to be zero. There is a little bit of, the com of a complication here because the discrete and the continuous variables, y and z, interact in multiple places, in two places. So if you want to remove an edge between a binary variable and a continuous variable, you need a whole set of parameters that needs to be set to zero. So it's a group. So it's like in the group class. So you have to zero out a whole group. And also these groups overlap. As you can see, these, um, these parameters coming from the covariate main, uh, covariance matrix appear in two sets of edges. So it is a little bit like G lasso, where you just want to zero out parameters except they come in groups and groups overlap. So it's, um, it's more complicated. Um, again, to mention um, related work, which maybe I should have done earlier, um, Hasty and his student Jason Lee, who I think is here or was here earlier, um, looked at basically what turns out to be a special case of our model where the covariance of y is independent of z. It's simpler to fit, but doesn't include all possible graphs. Um, and um, this group, uh, which is Peter Bowman and his collaborators, um, looked at mixed models as well with discrete and continuous variables doing neighborhood selection um, using just random forests, so completely non-parametrically, I guess. So they get selection, but there is no generative model, so you can't analyze it if you're so inclined. And you can't interpret the parameters. Um, so how do we fit this? Again, because we have binary variables as part of it, we have an intractable constant, so we can't do likelihood. So again, we look at conditional log likelihood, which is a lot like neighborhood selection. And if you write down the conditional likelihood and simplify it and see what it reduces to, you find that it's actually quite simple. It reduces to linear regression with these terms for continuous variables and logistic regression with this set of terms for binary variables. So that's something that we know how to do very well, um, except these parameters are in overlapping groups. So um, if we just use the regular lasso, then we won't be able to guarantee that we zero out the whole group. 
We could use group loss, so there are actually many proposals now on how to, on, on different penalties that allow you to zero out a whole group of parameters at the same time. This is one of them, which has been used a fair amount. There are two norms instead of one norm. Uh, but that's computationally much more difficult than, say, lasso, and especially with overlaps, so it's kind of tricky. So we ended up doing um, sort of something in between, which um, worked out quite well, um, empirically at least. We wanted to do the um, L2 penalty, but that was just too complicated. So, well, I say approximate, it's not really an approximation, it's an upper bound, right? The two norm is bounded by the one norm. Um, and in this two example, so let's say I just have three parameters and they are in two groups of two and um, the second one is in both groups, right? So they overlap. Um, this is what these two feasible regions look like. So by using the <clears throat> L1 bound, we're making it smaller, but almost all the feasible points, um, or almost all the corners really are the same, right? So they coincide. So it's a, it's a reasonable um, approximation. And then it reduces to just the last, so except with weights, because then the, um, the overlapped parameter, the parameter that appeared in both groups is counted twice. Um, let me skip this. Um, and um, then all we have to do is do regression, either regular linear regression or logistic with weighted L1 penalties, but the weights are fixed. They're actually either one or two, depending on whether that's an overlapping parameter or not. They don't depend on the data, they're not adaptive. So in terms of the synthetic behavior, it's basically just standard um, kind of lasso type asymptotics. Um, we just went through it and saw that we can still do it all. Um, all you need to do is basically rescale the design matrix to account for the weights and then understand the assumptions it all holds in. I'm not going to write it out. Um, and let me just finish with a quick example. This is, um, this is purely for um, comic relief at the end of a long day. Um, this is not cancer or anything like that. This is a music data set. Um, there are 502 observations, which are songs. There are uh, 120 discrete variables, which are labels assigned to them by human experts, uh, which tell you things like um, the genre of the music, what instrument it uses, uh, what kind of usage would be good usage for that music, and, and so on. Um, so these are kind of soft um, labels supplied by humans. And then there are continuous features, which are sort of hard features, um, just extracted from the audio signal, from the time series of the audio signal, which are basically various functions of the Fourier coefficients. And they also represent certain features of the signal, such as brightness and noisiness and amplitude and so on. Um, and so this is the kind of picture you can get here. Um, these squares are the continuous variables, so that's the audio data. The round ones are um, the labels, so you can see that you get some interactions, because you get a lot of interactions within the continuous variables, which you would expect because they're all coming from the same time series, but you also get interactions between um, continuous and discrete variables. And of course, within discrete ones as well, the different colors represent different types of labels, which you, you can't read here, but just some, um, some selected edges, um, such as, let's say, noisiness is associated with negative feelings, whereas likable songs are associated with driving for some reason. So it's just the stuff that you can extract out of it, which sort of makes sense. Um, and um, you, know, you find things that connect this, sort of hard data and soft data, which is kind of nice, but th this is just for entertainment. So um, let me wrap up and um, just say that graphical models with all their shortcomings and high dimensions are, I think, still a nice exploratory tool if you just want to look at the data and see what connections there are. Um, 
a lot of times in, in real applications, they need to be more flexible than just the standard Gaussian model, say, because there are more complicated things going on. So the two particular scenarios that we looked at is conditioning on covariates, then you get a covariate or a subject-specific model, so you can interpret stuff, and mixed models just allow you to put discrete and continuous variables together, which you really should be able to do as a statistician. There are lots of other open questions, um, such as learning mixtures of graphical models in an unsupervised fashion. If you have data that comes from different models, you think, but you don't know which ones. Um, there could be much more complex covariate relationships one could explore. And um, ultimately, um, combining graphical models with network models, um, which actually network models is something that I um, work on a lot, actually much more than in graphical models now. And um, they kind of two separate literatures developing in parallel, which I think would be nice to connect together. And also, of course, um, computational feasibility. If we wanted to scale, you know, as the GLASO now scales to millions of variables for these more complicated things, then we need to do more work. And these are the two references to the papers that I talked about. They're both in the archive. Oh, let me stop there. So, um, so you have a choice, right? Just like the neighborhood selection, you can um, do a different <coughs> parameter for each, but then that's a lot of cost, you know, a lot of parameters to choose. Or you can just do one for each type and then maximize it, which is what we do. Thank you.